kind enough to adjust his schedule and join us as he does every week, even in an abbreviated one, is our good friend, senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joining us. And, uh, Greg, I know it's a couple of uh, days in the rearview mirror, and Greg's weekly segment, incidentally, presented by Scout Scott Lawnyard, an official commercial site work partner of the Buffalo Bills. I know it's a couple of days in the rearview mirror, Greg, but um, really as tight a performance as Buffalo could have played in a game where margin for error is minimal, <laughs> um, just your overarching thought about the Bills' performance front to back all three phases. I mean, yes, Josh had the interception, but as far as making mental errors and mistakes in this game, the Bills were pretty buttoned up, it seemed. Well, Brownie, just before we start, I just got to say that, you know, after hearing you, I got to say you're a beast with a capital B. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you got me on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it was uh, – I'm never surprised by the Bills' offense just because Josh Allen can do special things. They couldn't run the ball very effectively at all, so the game really came down to to Josh. Um, I think he had 45 dropbacks in the game, which my guess would be that that's not what the game plan was going in. But they really couldn't run the ball, which you know may have been a surprise, may not have been a surprise given the quality of the defense they were playing against. Um, And again, the interception was kind of a fluky play. Um, Clearly... uh, Josh felt that Knox would continue to on that route, and he didn't. Um, it obviously didn't, you know, have a major impact on the game, um, but it was a pretty buttoned-up performance by Josh. There were no negative plays, really. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I looked, and this is a larger statement that I'll make a comment about the defense, but he's only been sacked 13 times in 11 yeah. games, and that's pretty remarkable given that he's not, at his core, you know, a true – timing rhythm player like you think of a drew Brees or a tom brady but yet to only be sacked 13 times is probably a testament to a a number of things o-line josh you know many things but you know i think in a game like that you just can't get stuck with bad plays it's one thing to have to punt but you can't get stuck and they didn't get stuck and i thought he also made some really really good plays too i mean you know i thought that the um the second completion to Cooper, the one that oh, got yeah. challenged, was, I mean, that was zero coverage, zero pressure. Um, he had to throw that ball super early because mm-hmm. Cooper ran sluggo, which is not normally a route you run if it's blitz. Maybe he didn't realize it. You know, that's a route that takes time. And Josh had to throw that ball so early, and it was placed perfectly. Um, but just to make a comment on the defense, watching the tape, um, I thought – that their defense throughout the game featured a lot of communication, late movement. It was evident that changing the picture pre-snap to post-snap was a significant part of their game plan, and they really didn't get caught there either with mistakes. And that's hard to do because normally if you're going to have a lot of communication, somewhere along the line there's a mistake that's problematic. Uh, There may have been one, I'm trying to think. I think... uh, um, Maybe unworthy. Uh, he was actually out of bounds on the play, but I think they got stuck there a little bit. But for the most part, they did not. Yeah, and this is a game, too, where when you talk about the Bills' offense, it comes down to Steve Spagnuolo and his, you know, that defense is yeah. hard to play against. And this yeah. was another one of those plays, although the Bills end up in this game scoring 30 points on the for the first time in 30, whatever, 33 games it was before this uh, by the Chiefs. What led to the Bills' ability to move the ball, I know they were really good on third down, 60%, That's 9 to 15, key. and half of their third downs, Brownie says, half of their third downs. 38 or more. Yeah, they were third and eight or more. Um, yeah. But why is um, it the Bills now are doing that? Because they weren't they weren't converting third no. downs like this early in the season. Last four games, Steve, they've been uh, 29 for 54, which is almost 54% third down, which, of course, as we know and we've discussed, they were really good on third down, what, maybe the last three years or so? The last Bradley, two years, like two, the last the two years they led the league, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, the early part of this season, they have been they were poor, but the last four games they've been really, really good. Um, and that's, you know, and, and it's funny because if you look at Josh Allen's stats on third down in those last four games, it's not like you go, oh, my God, he's been killing it on third down. Um, but they make enough of them um, 
and you always have the Allen factor, you know, with his movement ability. I mean, even the touchdown to Samuel, um, the first one in the fourth quarter, did not come on third down, but that was another zero coverage, zero pressure play where he moved away from a free hitter. Connor was free on this one. We're seeing it right here, and it was a great catch by uh, Samuel. Um, they ran mesh which, of course, is the same thing they ran on the fourth and two when they expected man and they got zone. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, they've just been really, really efficient on third down. And when you're efficient on third down, even if the, your overall offensive numbers aren't great, you can still, um, you know, you still sustain offense and you still move the ball. And, and as we know, even though they didn't really sustain with the run game in this game, they've been able to pretty much sustain with the run game in previous weeks. Getting back to what you said about Josh not being sacked, the Bills were first in the league in sacks allowed last year on offense, and it's due in part to the fact that I think their offensive line has stayed remarkably healthy since last year, knock on wood. I don't think they had any man games lost to injury last year. They did have one last week lost by Spencer Brown, and Osiris Torrance and Ryan Vandemark on the right side of the line. There were times where they left Torrance in one-on-ones with Chris Jones, and he didn't and he looked like he could handle it at times, uh, which agree. is saying something because nobody really does that going against Chris Jones, number one. And then number two, just your thoughts on Vandemark's performance over there on the edge on the right side. Yeah, I thought it was really good. I mean, let's just get back to, to, to uh, Torrance for a second because 45 dropbacks by Josh Allen. Chris Jones, as a pass rusher, was a non-factor in the game. He made a couple of plays in the run game that you know where Chris Jones plays. Um but as a pass rusher, he was really not a factor in the game, right? Can you remember any guys where he was really not really? A big I mean, factor? maybe uh, a there, pressure there, there or might something. Be some where he got close, but yeah, he wasn't. A, yeah, he but wasn't I mean, a factor. Because normally he's the kind of guy that can wreck your game, yes, particularly in critical situations, and that was not the case at all. So Torrance, you're right. I, I did notice that watching the tape that they let uh, Torrance uh, block him one on one on numerous plays, uh, and he did a really really good job. Um, and even Vandermark at right tackle, he wasn't really beat to the point where he went, boy, that, that's that's going to be a struggle today. That wasn't the case at all. Um, now, the run game overall, they just they just couldn't run the ball. I mean, that that was a, a situation where the Chiefs defense really did a good job. And, yeah, and they're the a top three just, run defense. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is a knock on the Bills. You know, yeah. the Chiefs are really, really good on defense. I mean, just to score 30 points against them, uh, is, is And to go 9 for 16, I think, or 9 for 15, whatever it was on yeah. third down, is really impressive. Yeah, and i got to ask you about the Bills running game because fans like – I mean, I'm sitting there watching this game, and there's, they keep handing it off on first down for zero yeah. yards or one yard or a half a yard or – you know what I mean? Um, it was pretty frustrating. But because it's such a tight game, they're not desperate to score points. They're trying no. to – what what are the Bills getting? And they getting, had 34 minutes in time of possession yeah, at the end. What are the Bills getting out of that run game if it's not yards? Well, you know, that's that's always a great question. And, and as you know, Steve, you've been doing this a long time. You know, there's a lot of uh, coordinators who believe that, hey, if we're not running the ball, let's abandon the run and, you know, let's just start tossing it all over the yard. But the one thing to keep in mind, too, is – you do have Josh Allen, who can make plays, okay? And, and and I know that's cliched, but it's true. But the other thing about the run game, and when you're playing against, a, a, you know, another offense that does have a great quarterback and can he can make special plays at any time, is you're also trying to control the pace and tempo of the game. Brownie just hit on a great point, Steve. They control the ball for 30 minutes without a run game. That's hard to do. Um But if you can control the pace and tempo of the game, the whole feel of the game changes for the opposing offense, even if your quarterback is Patrick Mahomes. It's just it's just human nature. So, you know, you you start you eat clock a little bit. Not that the goal is to eat clock. The goal is to score touchdowns, obviously. But, you know, you just the game is, is played sort of at your pace and at your tempo. You know, you know, Steve, there's nothing worse than a three and out where you throw the ball three times and there's three incompletions. I mean, it feels like the whole game changes when that happens because 12 seconds go off the clock and, you know, and it just feels like it's, it's a a bad deal all the way around. Yeah. Uh, It feels like the possession never happened. Yeah. That's a great way to say it. And you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. Speaking of the run game though, Greg, one area where they have consistently run well 
is in the low red zone, which most yes. people, most yes. teams have a big problem running the ball consistently down there. My question to you is, do you feel that the offensive line should get full marks for that, or does Josh Allen and the concern for him aid the team in running in the low red zone? Because he's not I the one doing the running nearly as much as he did right. last year. It's mostly Cook now. I think it's a combination, though, because you have to account in the way you line up defensively for the Josh factor. And the other thing I'd add to that, and it was evident on the second Cook run, but I think we've seen it all season. I think you guys would agree. James Cook is a little tougher physically than his size might indicate. I mean, that second touchdown run, I forget who he ran through. Brian or Cook. Over. Yeah, Brian yeah, Cook. But yeah, but I mean, and Brian Cook's not a small safety, by the way. Um, so, you know, Cook is, is you know, we're not going to compare Cook to Emmett Smith here, but I mean, you know, teams that can run the ball in the low red zone, you know, that was true of those Cowboys teams. I mean, what happens is, is the quarterback ends up not throwing a ton of touchdowns, and it feels like Josh has been kind of stuck on, I mean, I guess he threw one this week, so he's up to 18. But, you know, he, he it always seemed as if he'd either get a running touchdown or a passing touchdown when they got in the red zone, Brownie, right? And now yeah. they give the ball to James Cook, and, and he scores. He's got 11 touchdowns. Yeah, th I, I, one of the things, yeah. too, both his touchdowns, and I, I said this earlier in the week, how much of a difference does it make, Greg, when you've got a running back who he outran the guys to the pylon, and he does that occasionally as well, but then also – He's yep. going up in between the guards, I mean, and he's getting a physical run like that done. Having a guy that does both of those things, what that's got to change it for the – and then, uh, Josh, you got a, a, you got a mule yeah, there's, who's absolutely yep. playing quarterback. So that changes things for the defense, right? It sure does. Because, you know, keep in mind uh, the Josh factor there, you know, the edges of the defense, guys just – you know, they can't just squeeze everybody inside. Right. Because then Josh just gets around the edge, and it's it's a walk-in. I mean, we've seen that with other quarterbacks. You know, you see that with the Kyler Murrays of the world, the Jalen Hurts of the world. You know, you just can't do that. So, you know, it all ties together. Um, and, you know, I think offensive linemen, you know, obviously take great pride in, in being able to run the ball because that's where it's just pure physicality. I mean, obviously there's technique and it's coached and all that. But, I mean, when you start getting into the seven, six, five, four yard line, you know, then you just have you. You're just trying to out physical whoever you're playing against. You, you, we're not trying to look pretty, right? Takeaways uh, have been a key component for the success of Buffalo's defense. Greg, they lead the league yeah. in takeaways with 21. They have the best turnover margin in the league. It's obviously been a big uh, factor in why the defense has been as successful as they've been because they don't wow you with the other numbers like total defense, run defense, pass no. defense, third down defense. None of that is even in the top five, let alone the top ten in many cases. The, and they've gotten at least one takeaway in every game this season, which is the longest streak in the NFL by far. And they've had multiple takeaways in seven of their 11 games. Um, my concern is, A, can it continue? And if it doesn't, is there enough under the hood there for them to still be a formidable defensive group? Yeah, and that's a hard question to answer. I mean, obviously, takeaways can change games. Look, they got the takeaway right away on the second play of the game. Um, but, um, you know, and they're not a heavy blitz team. Like, you know, it's funny because you don't come away from watching them going, man, they just do some really cool stuff. I think what they do, and and um, I've actually heard Bill Belichick talk about this because he's in our building um, every week now, and I've heard him talk about it, that with Sean, it, there's, there's a lot more sort of subtlety to what they do as opposed to, you know, like a Rex Ryan defense where you just see all kinds of blitzes. You know, they're not really like that, but yet, there's subtlety on the back end. I talked about the communication and the the pre to post snap movement. I mean, those are more subtle things, and that's really the way they play. Now, I think Rousseau has really kind of developed into a pretty formidable edge rusher. Um, and obviously, Von Miller played, I think, over 20 snaps. And there were snaps in addition to the sack in which he was – you noticed that he was out there um, – but they're predominantly a four-man D-line pass rush. Um, now, again, this game's different than most because they did spy a bit. They used Bernard. Bernard actually had a sack in which he was a spy on third and five on the second possession of the game um, uh, where Mahomes actually left the pocket to his left. But, um, yeah, they're not one of those, you know, like exotic fan. You, you know, the way I would almost describe it, and, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of detail that I don't know about because I'm not in their meeting rooms, 
but they're more of a vanilla defense than an aggressive exotic defense. Give me. Let me ask you about the Bills' pass rush. I mean, you've got AJ Epinesa, you've got uh, Javon Solomon, Von Miller, Greg Rousseau, Casey Tuhill on the edges, and then down inside with Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, Austin Johnson. Yeah. Give us a, your. I mean, where would you just by the? Where do you observe they fall? How good are they? Uh, comparison to everybody else, and how big of an effect do they consistently have? Well, I, I think they're, um, I think they're consistent week to week in what they do. Um, as I said, I think Rousseau has become. I mean, he's not, you know, JJ Watt uh, or, or, or I mean, TJ Watt or, or, or Miles Garrett or you know Nick Bosa, but I think he's become a pretty strong edge pass rusher. Um, and then inside, I think they, they all have moments. I think Oliver has moments. Daquan Jones has moments. Um, you know, but but I, I don't know if I, Steve, would say that they're a top five, four-man D-line pass rush unit in the league. But I think they can pressure. Um, yeah. You know, and I think it does start with Rousseau, and he plays on both sides. Yeah, right. and actually, you might be surprised to know that going into last week's game, Rousseau had just as many quarterback knockdowns as Miles Garrett and Nick Bosa. He was tied. Yeah, with there those you two go. Guys. You know, so, so but, um, uh, and, and I'd be curious, you know, in, in if you talk to offensive coordinators, how they view him, because I've always felt that very often the way you evaluate a pass rusher is not necessarily his sacks, sometimes not even the pressures, although that's good, but how offenses account for them. Because if offenses have to account for them by deploying more people, you know, chippers, or keep someone in, or change their formation by putting a tight end there, which limits what they can do formationally, that to me is always more of a sign of, of the value of a pass rusher than just, oh, you know, what's the, what's really the difference when a when a, a rusher rushes 400 times in between 11 sacks and 14 sacks? Is that really a meaningful difference when there's 400 pass rushes? Right. Yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, one, last one for me. I, I, we're kind of starting to see on the horizon. We've got a bye week. Brownie and I are taking off the rest of the week after the day. So, there's, you know. But right. the 49ers are playing this weekend against Green Bay. And yep. Nick Bosa came up lame this last week. Yeah. And the minute he came up lame, Jameis Winston – or I'm sorry, uh, was it Geno Smith? Yeah, Geno Smith. Their whole, their whole defense yeah. changed because – they are yes. a pure four-man D-line pass rush team. They had one pass rush in that game in which they rushed five, and they've been that way all season long. So with Bosa out, unless they're going to change up this week against Green Bay in Green Bay, if Bosa can't go, I don't know. You know, we're talking on a Wednesday. I don't know what his status right. is. Obviously, they're on the West Coast, so they haven't even practiced yet. Um, but, um, you know, unless they change up, that's the way they played all season. And if he can't go their pass rush really becomes limited. Greg, thanks as always. Uh, we'll enjoy the bye. You enjoy week 12. And uh, we'll yeah. catch up with I you next week. I don't get a bye week, Brownie. See. Yeah, I know you don't. That's why I said you enjoy week 12. We'll get the bye, and we'll talk to you in week 13. No rest. <laughs> Greg, there is no rest for the wicked. But <laughs> yeah, not, there you I'm go. I'm not saying anything. I'm just no. saying. All right. All, All right. right. We'll, we'll catch up with you next week. I appreciate that. I was with you guys today. Thanks so much. 